morning. Welcome to Living Hope Church. Uh, today is July the 26th, and uh, we have a, a good group of people here today. We have Cole on the drums. We've got Dave over there on bass, and we have Jessica and Catherine singing. My name is Mike Brosma. I'm also here along, and uh, actually Jessica is going to lead us in uh, a few announcements and uh, a word of greeting today as well. So Jessica, why don't you take it away? Good morning, everyone. Um, just a few announcements for this morning. Um, so next week, Sunday, is August 2nd. And we are celebrating Lord's Supper, and Glenn Duncan will be leading communion. So just prepare your hearts this coming week, and also make sure you have some bread and juice ready at home um, so you can partake with your family. Also, Tuesday, July 28th, Living Hope is hosting a prayer night in the church building. But you need to contact Christy Stover because um, you have to register because there's only a certain amount of people allowed, you know, um, if you're not able to attend, um, set aside some time that evening anyway and pray along with us. Um, today, Norma Heemskirk is leading us in congregational prayer, and Mike just wanted to explain that he's sharing a passage from Scripture and leading a short meditation today for the message. So I'll be reading from, our call to worship comes from Revelations 5, verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise.
is the lamb who was slain? Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Thank you so much for the words of the song and what they mean. We thank you that you, you took our, our cross upon your shoulders. Um, and we think of whatever that cross was in this past week, whatever, uh, whatever the, the pain was that we may have caused someone, whatever the, the pain was that we may have caused ourselves by, by guilt or, or shame, uh, we thank you that you've taken all of that and you've taken it away. We lay that down before you now and we are free. So Father, we, we praise you the Father, the, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, we worship you this morning. We thank you so much.
Good morning, people of Living Hope. Um, yeah, it's me, Mike Verzma, your worship director. Um, I, it's my honor and privilege to be able to share with you from the Word this morning and, and some reflections on that. Um, let me give a, a quick disclaimer. I am not an ordained pastor. Um, I've been a worship director for, and worship leader for 30 years or so. I've heard a lot of sermons, and uh, it is my honor to be able to read to you from the Word this morning. Uh, I'd like us to begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in this moment. We know that your word is alive and living, and we ask that you illuminate that for us now, that we would hear uh, the stories that you have uh, spoken into being into this word. May we reflect upon it, and may you bless it um, to your will and to your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Bible is full of fascinating stories, and uh I've been drawn to reading stories a little more deeply than maybe I was used to. Um, a few weeks ago, our youth pastor, Al Westerman, was leading a sermon talking about getting into Scripture and making that a daily habit. Um, even last year, our, our former pastor, Sean Ricks, talked about holy habits and about diving into the Word. And, and if I may, as I said in my opening, I, I've, been, I've been a worship leader for a lot of years and, and read the Bible a lot of times. If I may confess, a lot of times I was reading to find a scripture to fit a song or to find passages to fit a service or hearing what the sermon was about and, and, and reading to find passages that supported that. Um, I honestly didn't read the Bible just to read the Bible for, for, for many years. Um, really that challenge started at the end of last year. My, my best friend, Jeff, uh, in his battle with cancer and ultimately um, succumbed to that last November. But in that journey, he and I would send, I would send Bible text to him, my verse of the day. I think Morgan mentioned that last week, Sunday or two weeks ago about uh, the verse of the day, Bible app. Great thing to have, by the way. And we would send just these texts back and forth, these, these pieces of scripture. And as a result of that, over the, over the days and months of, of my friend's journey, um, he was de digging deeper into the word and, and so was I. And it was illuminating and, um, you know, it, it was coming alive and, and it was speaking and it was an amazing journey. And so I do challenge you to start small, as Pastor L said, but read the word and read it daily and let it speak to you because it is alive. So often the stories we read in the Bible, we've, we've heard so many times and are just stories. You know, we kind of breeze through them and we're looking for something. Um, I'm drawn to the gospel specifically and to the words of Jesus, the work of Jesus and what he's done. Uh, Jesus healed many, many people, and and so often in, in, in the text, it's kind of something happens, he heals them, and they, and they move on, and there's a life lesson there, Jesus teaching his disciples and, and people, um, but not a lot of attention drawn to stuff that happened behind the scenes. There's just one story in particular in, in John, in chapter 9, where the whole chapter is dedicated to this particular story. What I'd like to do now is just simply read the chapter and I'll stop along the way to give kind of my thoughts on it because again I'd like to I like to imagine what it would have been like to have been there or to think of a of the story a little deeper uh, and then and then give a short application of it to our lives and so this is from John uh, like I said chapter 9 the whole entire chapter and, uh, and we'll be stopping through it and this is Jesus healing uh, a man born blind and it's broken into three sections into my Bible it's the, Jesus heals the man, and then it's the Pharisees investigate the healing, and then spiritual blindness, where Jesus kind of wraps up this story. So let's read this together. John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that right up the, right up the top, what a, what, a, what a question. You know, we think, my goodness, really, everybody with a disability has sinned? I mean, in the Jewish culture, uh, that often was the case. They thought, well, there must have been something wrong with his, him or his parents. And honestly, that, that does prevail a bit today, too. I know uh, I've heard a number of people say to people with, a, with an illness or a disability saying, well, there must be sin in your life. Maybe God can speak that way, but here's Jesus' answer, which is so liberating. Neither this man, this is the words of Jesus now, neither this man nor his parents sin, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God may be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in this world, I am the light of the world. 
what a, what a great what a great word from Jesus. You know, um, as long as we're we're living in a broken world, you know, and and we we do work and we do things to reflect God's glory to us, even with disability. I just find that such a, a neat little nugget right there in the story. Continuing on now, having said this. He spit on the ground. Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Shalom. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. I've often wondered, why did Jesus have to spit? I mean, he spit. Seriously. He <clears throat> spit in the mud. <laughs> and made blah on the... That's not very medically cleansing, is it? That's, why? And I wonder why. Jesus could have gone, you're healed. Or touched his eyes. All kinds of things. It's kind of neat, though. That plays into the story later on again. So this man came home seeing. He washed his eyes. He could see his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim he was. And others said, no, he looks like him. You can imagine. These people, let's just call him Buddy because I have a name for him. So Buddy is sitting on a corner every day. He's blind. He's begging. Everybody knows who Buddy is. Everybody knows this guy. Think of someone you know that's been in, I don't know, in a wheelchair their whole life or something, and you saw them walking around. You're like, is that really? No, it can't be. This is what was happening. So they would see the guy and they go, that can't be Buddy. No. <laughs> and so, but the man himself, Buddy himself, said, I am the man. Well, how is it that your eyes are open? They demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Shalom and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he says. Remember, he was blind. He never saw Jesus. He sent him away. So he's never seen the Jesus. Amazing. But you can imagine for a moment, if, you knew, if this was you, you'd be telling everybody. So this man is telling everybody. This, he went to his family, I'm sure, to his parents right away. Went to his family, his friends, anybody who could see him. Hey, this was me. This thing happened. Amazing. Ah, just think of the behind the story. I don't know. So now the next section. The Pharisees investigate the healing. Now, the Pharisees, think about it. Uh, the leaders of the church. This, this was a big deal. This wasn't just, okay, the, your pastor. This was the Pharisees. This this, this was the, the, the rulers of the land um, in the Jewish country from a religious perspective. Um, it'd be like, oh, I'm not even our classes, be our synod kind of a thing. You know, the overall body that, that governed our church. If, if the Catholics would be the Pope kind of a thing. You know, so that big deal was a huge thing. So the Pharisees, they, now, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now on the day which Jesus had made mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Always got in trouble for working on the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him now how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man said. I washed, and now I see. Again, telling the story over and over again. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And others said, well, how can a sinner do miraculous signs? And they were divided. So there was argument within the, within the, the Pharisees and the leaders. Finally, they turned to him again, to the blind man, and said, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes that were opened. Well, the man replied, well, he is a prophet. Now the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Can you imagine? They sent for his mom and dad. He go, we don't believe this guy. He's, think he's, he's a bit nuts. Let's bring his parents in. So they drag his parents into this proceeding. They ask his parents, is this your son, the one that you say was born blind? Well, how is it that he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. We know he was born blind. And how we can see now, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. What a statement. Think about that. Your mom and dad come in to defend you, and they say, well, yeah, it's him, but we don't know what happened. So ask him. Odd. You think about that. But, but here it explains why. Now, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided or acknowledged or decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. 
And that is why his parents said he's of age, ask him. Now, put out of the synagogue doesn't mean just, okay, you have to leave. No, you were excommunicated, I guess, in a sense. You were put out of the synagogue. You couldn't go to the one down the street. That was it. You were out. And so the, the Pharisees had great power in this, in this culture. And so the parents were afraid. They didn't want to get kicked out of church. So, you know, so they were worried for this, 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 this about this. A second time, began the word of God. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man's a sinner. He replied, now, this is, this is a, such a key verse in here. I'm going to come back to it again later. But he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind and now I see. They asked, they asked again. They asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? This is a classic answer. He answered, I have already told you and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> that that takes some, uh, some guts to do that. I mean, that, that's, that's sarcasm. <laughs> Can you imagine though? This guy's told the story probably a thousand times by now. And they keep asking, he's like, oh, for crying out loud, do you, do you want to hear it again? And sarcastically, do you want to become his disciples too? Well, that did not go well. Um, they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Now that's, you know, he's, they're, they're upset with him. Again, the fear, you would think this guy would back down, but this is great. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. What a statement. That's remarkable. This is a simple man, uneducated, blind from birth. So he didn't have the... the, the um, the affording of, of, of education or any of that. Just a simple man. And that's what he says to them. To this they replied, you were steeped at sin, in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. To conclude the chapter. Jesus heard that, he had, that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so I may believe in him. Remember, he never saw Jesus. Okay. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him at the time heard, his, heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. You know, Jesus doesn't mince words. He says some pretty uh, hard and difficult things to hear. He's telling these people of, of the religion, of, of God's servants, okay? We're praying the, the will of the Lord and the most of people, the leaders, that you profess to be able to know and see the word and that you don't see it right in front of you. You are blind and that, that's why you're guilty. How can you blame someone who can't see? For not knowing. It's remarkable. You know, the simplicity of this story is, is really the man giving that account for what happened. He, was, he said to the Pharisees earlier that, hey, um, we know that you, we know that nobody can just heal somebody without God. That has to be from the Lord. 
the ultimate conclusion is this got it, this must come from God. Um, you know, in, in, in 1 Peter 3.15, um, he talks about, um, let me just read it to you, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I've always taken great comfort from this story that we just read. In, in the fact of the matter is this. Um, some, we get barraged with questions from our society, right? From people, from coworkers, and, and from the, the Pharisees of this world, uh, from the people who don't want to see Jesus uh, succeed or lift it up and say, what is this? What is that? What is this? And trying to trip us up about things. The answer is very simple. I don't know about what you're talking about. This is what I do know. Yesterday I was blind, and today I can see. As it says in 1 Peter, give account of the hope and joy that we have in our lives. As Christians, we don't need to know all the answers. We can't know all the answers. Um, but to ready to give account for the hope and a reason for that, we can only speak to our own experience. Um, what was our blindness? You know, hey, I used to live in anger, and now I try to I try to live in kindness. Since I found Jesus, I I try to I, I I do my job more honestly. Since I found Jesus, I treat people with respect better than I used to. Um, you know, give account for that hope. What changes it made in our life? We don't need to know all the answers. But as Jesus concluded, that is, that the blind will see. And sometimes when we think we know it all, we lose uh, the truth. So when you read the word of God, um, read a little deeper. Think about the stories and what they're trying to say to us. Imagine yourself being in the story. Um, it's truly fascinating and, and absolutely a joy to read it, for it is the living word. Um, Let's just conclude with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you again for your word. We thank you for um, putting it to paper so that we may read it and be part of it. We know that it is a lie that you inspired it. Thank you for the words of, of Jesus. Let them inspire us. Lord, as, as you're working in our hearts, as we're, as we're becoming, uh, seeing more and more, you're, you're taking the blinders off of our eyes that we may see in our hearts that we may see you. Let us always seek that truth. Lord, and, and work in us to give account, to give us courage and boldness to speak clearly of what you've done in our lives. Thank you for that revelation that we don't need to always know all the answers. But we do need to know the hope that we have. Give us, as I said, Lord, courage and boldness to speak that to people around us. May you be uh, glorified through all of this. Um, and may we reflect this joy to the world that we live in. We pray these things. We thank you, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' name.
Good morning. My name is Norma Heemskirk. I would, it's my privilege to pray for you this morning. And I'd just like to draw your attention to one thing. This has been kind of a surreal year. And we've been separated, we've been isolated. We've had many things happen to us that are just out of the ordinary. I wanna challenge you at this time to take your Bible and study some of the people in the Bible that have also gone through tragedies and trying times because we can glean a lot from what is in there. Also, to seek him for direction through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do seek you right now. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you have taken us through a most difficult time. And Heavenly Father, quite frankly, we can be exhausted at times like these. From changing one thing to changing another, Lord, and tempers can flare and things can get very much out of hand. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that people would stop for a moment and reach out to you for direction. Lord, I pray we would be understanding with each other and kind to one another. Lord, there's so much going on in this world right now. We need to be close to you. We pray for our world leaders. Lord, there are so many countries in turmoil, so many countries that are going through things. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would come by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and be with the leaders, that they make good choices and wise choices. We pray for our country, Heavenly Father. We pray for unity in our government alone, Heavenly Father. There's that challenge of leaders working together and we pray for that. We pray for Canada regarding borders and openings and going through the stages of restoration. Lord, it's not easy, but you have helped us so far and we thank you that you will continue to be with us. Lord, I thank you for our community of Peterborough, Lord, and the people who have been so helpful, people in the stores and emergency uh, helpers, Heavenly Father, uh, people who have kept our town running despite the challenges. We're thankful and grateful. We're also grateful for those who have kept our churches running during the time when we can't meet publicly, but you have helped us, Lord, to keep going and keep worshiping you. Lord, we do come to you with requests. We do come to you with needs that we have. At Living Hope, we need a new pastor. At a time when you choose Heavenly Father, we pray that it would be the person of your choosing. Lord, I'm reminded of Ezra in the Old Testament, who was an exile, a priest and a leader, and he was called to go back to his homeland after being exiled for many years and rebuild the spiritual foundation for Jerusalem. Lord, it was a daunting task, but Ezra gave everything to you and prayed, and you blessed him, and you gave him everything he needed to lead his people. Lord, I pray that the person that you choose for Living Hope would be the person that is called to it, and that you would direct our search committee as they uh, continue to do the work on finding someone, Lord. Lord, we look for a person of your choosing. We also look to you as we open up church, as many churches are opening up, Lord, with guidelines from the health department and all sorts of things that, that are needed to do to get the church up and running. We pray that you would help us, that you would continue to bring people in, pray that you would help us in every single way that we need help, Lord. We know where our help comes. Our help comes from you. You look after us and you care for us, and we are thankful and grateful. Lord, be with those who are sick, those who are having babies at this time, those who are getting married in different circumstances, and those who, whose loved ones have passed away, and they have to go through losing a loved one in a much different way. We pray for our old age homes, Lord, and our hospitals, and all of the people that work there, we pray for comfort for people who have had a really rough time. And we ask you, Lord, to continue to give us strength and courage to get through the rest of this time. And we also thank you for the hope that we have of your coming. Lord, we do believe that you are coming soon. And we want to be ready, Lord. Help us to remember to use our Bibles to get into the Word and study. And Lord, we want to be a blessing to you. 
So we thank you for that, and we'll give ourselves to you at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.